In this video, we'll talk about calculating heat transfer rates, heat transfer coefficients, and Neusselt numbers. Remember that for external flow, we had the free stream temperature as a reference. Well, in internal flow, we have the average or the mean temperature across a cross section at a particular location, x. From the first law of thermodynamics for a control volume, assuming no work, no changes in kinetic and potential energy, and steady state conditions, we could get an expression for the heat transfer rate in terms of the mass flow rate and the change in enthalpy. And for an incompressible substance with constant specific heats assumed, we can put the delta H in terms of delta T. The delta T is the change in temperature from the inlet to the outlet of the control volume. In other words, Q is a function of the change in mean temperature. To get an expression for those mean temperatures at the inlet and the outlet, we can think of things in terms of the rate of thermal energy going into the control volume and the rate of thermal energy going out. We could define the mean temperature as the integral of the derivative of m dot times Cp times te temperature, and putting that mass flow rate in terms of density and velocity, which is a function of r and x, and the differential cross-sectional area. This is a similar strategy that we used when we got an expression for the mean velocity. We solve for the mean temperature difference, divide out the Cp, define the derivative of the cross-sectional area as 2 pi r dr, and the area is pi r naught squared, and finally we have an expression for the mean temperature which is related to the velocity profile. Let's consider the special case of a constant surface heat flux over, the section, over a section of the pipe. So that would be the case if we had an electrical heating across the pipe. Remember that we defined our heat transfer rate as m dot Cp times the change in the mean temperature. Well, I could define Q in terms of the flux uh, times the surface area, where the surface area is just the perimeter times the change in x or the length. And next we equate those two things and take the derivative of each side with respect to x. We see that the dx cancels out on the right hand side, and then dividing through by m dot Cp, we get an expression for dtm dx. Multiplying each side by dx and integrating, we get the left-hand side in terms of the outlet and the inlet mean temperature. And on the right-hand side of the equal sign, the heat flux is constant, the perimeter is constant, the mass flow rate is constant, and the specific heat is constant. So integrating from zero to some location x just gives us x. We can then move things around and solve for the mean temperature at the outlet, which will of course depend on the length of that section of the pipe. So as you can see, the change in the mean temperature is linearly dependent on x. So that's what you see in the graph here, but what about the surface temperature? How does that change with x? Well, as you recall, in the thermal entrance region, h decreases with x. So the difference between the surface temperature, uh, the, the surface temperature and the mean temperature will increase with x in order to keep that heat flux constant. In other words, the surface temperature will be increasing at a faster rate with respect to x than the mean temperature. But once the flow is fully thermally developed, H is constant. So the difference between Ts and Tm is constant, if the heat flux is constant. And the surface temperature, Ts, will be increasing at the same rate with respect to x as the mean temperature. The big takeaway message is, if the surface, or if the surface heat flux is constant, the surface temperature cannot be constant. Furthermore, since d t m d x is a constant, it means that the average temperature does not change with respect to x. In other words, for a constant surface flux, the temperature profile shape will remain the same down the length of the pipe. Now let's look at the different case of a constant surface temperature. So this must, might be the case if you have a substance flowing over the pipe while it's undergoing a constant pressure and thus temperature phase change. First, we define our heat transfer rate just as before. We take the derivative of both sides with respect to x just as before. Now we define the heat flux in terms of Newton's law of cooling. We divide both sides by m dot Cp. Next, we introduce delta T as Ts minus Tm. And if the surface temperature is constant, the derivative of delta T is just the negative of the derivative of the mean temperature. We divide both sides by delta T and get all the delta T terms together and the X terms together. And now we integrate um, one over delta T from delta T at the inlet to the outlet on the left-hand side and zero to L on the right-hand side. All the constants can come out of the integral on the right with the local heat transfer coefficient remaining in the integral. Now I'm gonna multiply that right side by L over L, which doesn't change anything, but it does look a lot like the formula for, the, for calculating the average heat transfer coefficient. I integrate and get a natural log on the left and an average heat transfer coefficient on the right. 
I can of course raise everything to the E and get rid of that natural log if I want to. So you can see that the delta T between the surface temperature and the average fluid temperature will decrease exponentially with the mean temperature of the fluid exponentially approaching the surface temperature as it flows through the pipe. If we want to get the heat transfer rate to the fluid over a certain distance, we could go back to our simple equation for Q. And now we rearrange our equation up there at the top to get an expression for M dot CP. We insert the equation for M dot CP into our equation for Q. And now I'm going to rewrite the temperature difference in terms of TS. Notice I haven't changed anything at all, but this allows me to write things in terms of delta T that I've been using. And then we define what's called the log mean temperature difference. And we have an expression for Q in terms of the average convection coefficient, the surface area, the log mean temperature difference, which is the temperature difference that drives that heat transfer. Now let's talk about the Neusselt number. Notice that we define that Neusselt number with a characteristic length. For a flat plate, that was L, but here it's D, the diameter. Also, in two flow, we typically define that convective heat transfer coefficient with the local heat flux. So we'd be interested in the local heat flux or the mean temperature of the, of the fluid at some location, or perhaps the tube's surface uh, temperature at some location. If we can get at all this local information, we can use that to get at the heat transfer for the entire section of the tube, as you'll see in just a second. Now, there are some very complicated derivations in your book, but some of the results are so simple that we're just going to skip to them. If the flow is laminar and fully developed, both thermally and hydrodynamically, and the heat flux is constant, the local Neusselt number is a constant 4.36. That makes sense that it's a constant because we know that in the fully developed region, H is a constant. We can relate that heat transfer coefficient to the total heat transferred if we just relate these two equations. If the surface temperature of the pipe is constant, the local Neusselt number is a constant 3.66. Because we have an equation for Q as a function of the average heat transfer coefficient for a constant surface condition, it's useful to have an equation for that. So that average H value takes into consideration the entrance region in which the local H value is decreasing in, the, in that entrance region. There are several equations given for the average heat transfer coefficient in the entrance region. The first one incorporates the greats number. Notice that the average Neusselt number is much greater at the entrance region as expected, but it decreases to the fully developed value of 3.66. So this equation is valid for fluids for very high Prandtl numbers. The second, which is even less prettier, can be used for lower Prandtl numbers. If the flow is turbulent, the Neusselt number is given by the didis bolter equation. You can see that this is valid regardless of the boundary condition. Um, it's a nice, simple equation for the Neusselt number, but in reality, if the temperature difference gets larger, this equation can have around a 40% error. There are other empirical correlations that are more accurate but more complex, and in this class, we'll just stick with this equation. So that gives us the local Neusselt number in the fully developed region for turbulent flow. Um, but what if we need the average Neusselt number over the entrance region and the fully developed region? Well, because the entrance region in the turbulent flow is small, uh, we assume that the flow is fully developed past 10, 10 diameters. So we can typically ignore that region and approximate the local Neusselt number for turbulent fully developed flow as the average Neusselt number over the entire pipe. Well, I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching.